It's late. You stand alone at the entrance to an abandoned highway tunnel, rumored to be haunted. You step inside, an empty abyss filled with the sound of creaking echoes from a gentle wind and your footsteps. Pitch black, only illuminated by the light coming from your phone as you correspond with the girl you made this dare with. Momo Ayase believes that ghosts and spirits exist, and she wants to prove it. So much that she is in another abandoned location looking for aliens. Something Ken believes exist. So here he is, looking for a ghost. As Ken listens to Momo talk about her belief in spirits and the supernatural, Ken sees something. It's not noticeable at first until it's right there in front of him. Familiar as any human, but just as unfamiliar in every way. Hair white as snow, with eyes empty as the tunnel itself. For Ken can react, respond to Momo, do anything. The spirit speaks its first words to him. How can you separate it if you let me double your schlong? Um... Okay. Check me out, John. I ain't a winner. Got a hot hand. Place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. I ain't a winner. Got a hot hand. Place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. Dandadan is an action-adventure, battle shonen, comedy romance, alien-infused, supernatural family manga about Momo trying to help Ken get his family jewels back with the help of their newfound supernatural powers. A series that, as you continue watching this video, will understand that everything inside it makes no f***ing sense whatsoever. It just doesn't. If you like complex and well-defined Hunter Hunter power systems and intricate realistic world building, you need to run because Dan Dan is coming for you and it doesn't care about any of that. Because of all the things I have just mentioned, Dan Dan at a glance can seem extremely stylistic with very little substance. How can a story with all these aesthetic style choices from different genres be mashed into one and still be taken seriously or have a well-defined and constructed narrative. That, on paper, should not work at all. But it does. So before I tell you how this manga can achieve that feeling that only a handful of media ever attain, I want to start with the man who made the series himself. Yukinobu Tatsu. Not much is known about Tatsu's personal life due to him wanting to keep it very private, but the only kind of backstory anyone seems to tout when talking about his presence in the manga industry before Dandadan is that he used to work for one of the most well-known manga creators in the space, Chainsaw Man creator and professional levitator Tatsuki Fujimoto. Despite keeping much of his personal life private, Tatsu has done many interviews talking about his time before Dandadan and even meeting Fujimoto. Much of this time was documented in an interview with Lientonot.com. Tatsu talks about how after his studies had finished, he worked at a konbini. During night shifts when he was bored, he would draw on the back of useless receipts. He didn't get the kick to start trying his hand at manga until his manager saw what he was doing, and instead of telling him to get the fuck back to work, he said he should try being a mangaka. Goated manager, by the way, like, holy shit. So, Tatsu got to work and drew a Gundam story that was over a hundred pages long, and submitted it to a competition in a magazine called Monthly Gundam Ace, which, as it sounds, just centers around Gundam. Tatsu's work didn't win, and it actually wasn't even selected into the competition, but the editors of the magazine believed he had great skill at drawing, Almost a better outcome, they asked him if he wanted to do some assistant work. Tatsu said yes, and began working on a series called Mobile Suit Gundam with Federation Hooligans. After gathering that experience as an assistant, Tatsu tried his hand at getting a serialization with a different magazine. And at the age of 25, Tatsu succeeded with the series The Justice of Rokugo. 
which was published in Kodansha's monthly shonen magazine in 2010. I would tell you the premise, but I can't. No official sites like Mal or Anilist even know the synopsis. There are no unofficial scans or fan translations on any other websites where you can read it. All we have is this one Twitter user who owns one of the very few copies in Japan. And in the panels he shows us, we see a young boy transforming with a small robot. We do know that the story only lasted two volumes before cancellation. Despite the series ending, Tatsu now had the taste of being serialized and probably felt like he could do it. So, three years later, he started his next series in the same magazine, Fireball. And luckily for this one, no, we can't read it either. There are no translations, there are no images of this one at all. And from this, you can guess its fate. After 19 chapters, it was eventually axed. The cover is the only thing to hint as what it was about, which implies a baseball sports manga, but with a much more strong definitive style, reminiscent of something like Soul Eater, and very different from Rokugo, which had this inner teen city vibe. Being his early work, I think these show the elements that Tatsu would later form into what Dandadan became. The next piece of his career began when he left Monthly Shonen and called up an editor at Jump Square called Shihei Lin. Lin today is one of the experienced editors in Shonen Jump Plus who is leading some of its most definitive titles. Chainsaw Man, Spy Family, Heart Gear, and of course, Dandadan. But getting into Square was where Tatsu got much more liberal with his creativity, creating two one-shot romance manga in 2015. During this, Lin was tasked with helping many different kinds of artists establish new titles in their newly founded online manga magazine, Shonen Jump Plus. It was on this platform that Lin offered Tatsu to be an assistant in some of its defining titles, the first being Fire Punch where he became an assistant to both Fujimoto and then eventually Yuji Kaku, who would later create Hell's Paradise. Lin, overseeing a group of mangaka that would create Jump Plus's defining series, was still trying to make sure that Tatsu was getting his chance. Tatsu eventually created another one-shot in 2019 for Jump Plus, which was about a young girl who fought Kaiju as a giant boxer. While seeing some success from this, the editorial board of Jump Plus did not see any of the other dozen projects Tatsu and Lin brought to them worthy to be serialized. It wasn't until Dan Dadan. And on April 6 of 2021, Dan Dadan was released with people pouring in throughout Jump Plus to this new quirky absurd manga that complemented the already established catalog. Using elements from all of his previous work, teen characters, style, romance, absurdity, and intense battles, Tatsu finally had his breakthrough piece. It is amazing how every single new experience the characters go through in Dandadan never feels like it wasn't already meant to be. What's great about this series is, like the intro of this video, it's subversive and it's random in its premise. I can tell you a situation that happens at any point in the series and it won't ruin your experience of the story or feel like a spoiler because you have no context in any way of how they get to this point. For example, a sentient anatomy statue runs naked through the school. A Buddha mixed with a Gundam has a fight with a knockoff kaiju. Characters get sucked into a board game. An exorcism is done with the help of an 80s rock band. Loch Ness Monster shows up. There is a fight with historical musicians Beethoven, Johann Sebastian Bach, and Mozart. A killer cult lady who screams Jennifer Lopez Anaconda. A hot grandma. Another hot grandma. The house becomes a cat. A nerd says Wiener. And finally, a giant crab. Part of the draw to Dandadan is this nonsense, not knowing what will truly happen next by any stretch of your imagination and how well into the story it will work. You would think the drawback is how it seems to not focus on the seriousness of it all, or how is this happening? But this absurdity is defined in character. Momo is the first character we meet, and in the first chapter, understand that she wants to meet a guy who is tough and quiet, like Ken Takekura, whom she loves a famous Japanese actor from the 80s who was known for his stoic look. Upon meeting our Ken, we learn that is also his full name, which she can never unlearn. So for the sake of associating that tough, stoic, brilliant acting gigachad Japanese face with this kid, he is given the name Okurun. But throughout the series, when people say Okurun's real name, it affects Momo physically because of a strong crush to the actor. In this scene here, when Ken sprints to the bathroom and Momo's granny psycho, yes, that's her grandma, 
says his full name, you could see how Momo falls to the floor in the back of the panels out of pure love. This happens in the most inconvenient of times as well, when Ida says Ken's full name only for Momo to lose concentration when using a force field. Much of what people assumed about Tatsu, because he was an assistant to Fujimoto, is that he inherited all these bizarre ideas and artistic drawing talent from him, but that's not true. Tatsu, Kaku, and Endo, who all assisted the younger Fujimoto, talked at length about films and stories who all each have developed their own artistic style and if anything have helped the youngest Fujimoto become more confident in his art, especially based on Fujimoto's comments on his drawings. But Tatsu emphasizes that what he learned the most from spending time with all of them is the idea of reinforcing character in the small things. Would they walk this way? How would they sit near this person? How would they stand in this room? These weird idiosyncrasies make the characters feel almost at one with the oddity of the manga's narrative. Granny Psycho, for example, is a laid back medium who understands the gravity of each situation and yet feels so relaxed and laissez faire. Hands through shorts, a sleeping mask with eyes, and her wild request to see Okoron's missing ball. Okay, okay. For science, obviously. This is all represented in the amazing art that Tatsu has cultivated for himself. From what we can see of Tatsu's earlier work, he is very efficient at portraying motion and character in action. So let's look at a few examples. This panel allows all the characters to be prominent in the frame, but still shaped around each other's actions, and of course, shows character. Okurun still not being a great fighter and getting his ass handed to him, even while transformed, shows that he doesn't really understand how to use his power, and in this arc particularly, that's his conflict. Momo with her telekinesis and the visual telegraph of her hands trying to subdue the situation, and Ira, who is very ladylike and embodies ballerina-like attacks. So she is using the tip of her toe to attack the man in his undies, and you'll notice she's actually trying to make sure she doesn't flash the reader or anyone else, especially Okurun, because he's in the room and she is, she's my lady. It's not an unheard of technique in manga, but it shows that essence Tatsu was talking about. Here is how every character would do this defining act of attacking, eating food, and even sleeping. It's one of those unnoticeable traits that flesh out characters, even in any other medium. One good example I want to highlight is the character called the Evil Eye spirit that possesses Gigi, who loves football. Even Tatsu shows us and mentions that he loves Paris Saint-Germain, a real-life football team. And I have to let you know that because you are probably a weeb. The evil eye, while in control of Gigi's body, uses a form of energy to attack besides his fists, a ball that can be controlled via predicted velocity, a supernatural football, if you will. Now, this not only evokes the character of the host, Gigi, but also helps visualize the flow of the fight. I've read some crazy action battle scenes in Weird Shonen, and the one major flaw is sometimes I actually can't fucking tell what's happening. So with this, guiding our eyes through the battle, not interrupting the flow, is something you would have seen if you read something like Dragon Ball Z. Energy that can draw the eye to a destination and indicate speed. These are common manga techniques, but heightening what is common makes the stories all the more interesting. Instead of Vegeta fly here and attack, I am watching an evil spirit in his tidy whities kick the football around. It helps when the art infuses the wacky style and death-defying epic fights that follow against the aliens and spirits our characters meet. Which are insane in how many there are. Which I understand for some people is a bit of a downside, and maybe I'll take this moment to shift gears and be a little critical of Dan to Dan. The only criticism I have, as well as other people with Dan to Dan's subject matter, is the very first chapter's imitation of sexual assault, played off like an ecchi joke. This is not new to Shonen, but I still think it's a problem when it comes to writing. That being said, after this specific scene, there is nothing closely related to that sequence of events, and my assumption is that Tatsu understood that this isn't the weird way he wants to portray his series. As you continue reading the plot, it does feel like it isn't progressing as much as it should be, and that in turn stagnates with the ultimate goal of getting Okarun's balls back. Speaking of balls, the oddness can become slowly desensitizing when you have read so many weird things happening in this story, and your expectations of what may happen next won't shock you as much as the last. 
That being said, that rarely happens. Whenever it does go weird, it's a new path of weird. It never feels like the same gimmick twice. For example, we have the giant crab, and then we have fighting classical conductors. I also don't think that these tropes bring down the story as Tatsu knows how to use them really well. For example, the whole will they won't they romance story that starts to blossom between Okurun and Momo. I understand this trope is tiresome in any romance story, manga or not, but remember that romance can be found in new flourishing friendships. The indecisiveness of acting on these feelings come from insecurities of the characters, and you can see that later in the video. Am I foreshadowing a later point in this video? Probably. Another trope people seem to have an issue with is the simplicity of a shonen plot. The idea of getting Okarun's jewels back is basically just like the One Piece in a metaphorical sense. Trust me, this makes sense. The One Piece is a goal that drives the characters to continue on their journey. And as long as what happens along the way is interesting and most importantly builds the characters and their overall development, the One Piece or the goal to the end of the series can be anything. The goal can be as silly as a golden bowl that came from the teenage boy. And that is the case with Dandadan. Learning or investigating strange phenomena to see where the jewels may be leads our characters to the strangest of beings who have stolen a high schooler's testicle. I don't know why. They, uh, they need it. And of course, these interactions build character, strengthen the relationships between our characters and also show new sides of them, which is exactly what you want. And I imagine some of you are not fascinated by the weirdness of Dandadan. Probably because manga are weirder today than they probably have ever been. And if you look hard enough, you will find a series that is just as bizarre and just as nonsensical. And because it has that unique identity, it probably doesn't mean that it's good, right? And that is definitely true. But there's a reason I'm talking about the weirdness and the art and how it shows that at this point in the video and not at the end because it is the premise that brings you in but it's not what you stay for the way dandadan handles its own weird identity in manga feels different because it's through subversion subversion is a tricky story element that in recent manga and anime is used to present a new kind of story element or a reversal of a story trope to surprise the audience presenting them with the exact opposite of what they were expecting. Because if done well, it is interesting, like One Punch Man. Or the subversion of motivations of a shonen character in Chainsaw Man. Subversion above all has to be interesting, but it's even better if it's emotional. The subversion of what you expect in Dandadan is actually what makes the weirdness of its story and characters shine, because you're not trying to put characters in weird situations, but change where the audience thinks the story is going in their situations. Let me give you an example in the manga. After a stint with the banana organ stealing aliens known as the Serpo, a boxing mantis shrimp singing Chiquita the Abba song survives, but collapses. The shrimp at first expects retaliation, but instead awakens to find food at the edge of the futon and bandages treating his wounds. Overwhelmed by the kindness of our protagonist, the shrimp explains why he was hired by the Serpo and his situation. See, he needed the money for his son. The son whose name he kept singing during the fight. He explains that his son has a severe medical condition that requires constant blood transfusions. And in Mr. Shrimp's homeworld, there are very few jobs with salaries as a single father that can sustain the medical bills they need to pay to keep his son healthy. And so he traveled off world to find work that will. He apologizes for the trouble and resolves to leave only for Granny to stop him and offer him a drink that his blood smells extremely close to. Milk, processed but pure enough, can sustain his son's life. And through some connections with other farmers, they offer Mr. Shrimp a cow to take home with goodwill as he vows to come back and repay this debt. Only for him to return during a fight, donning his boxing gloves and ready to fuck up this crazy cult lady and help stop a volcano from destroying the nearby town with the help of the walkie-talking anatomy guy. Now that's Taro. We like Taro in this house. 
The same subversion of enemy characters happens with the supernatural as well. These ancient spirits as old as time who have become twisted by the malice of their existence with backstories that service why they became what they are and why they're so vicious against the living. This feels fresher to me as characters in any other yokai or evil spirit based manga nowadays because they rarely use the idea that these entities had a past or a reason for doing what they did besides nature or the convenience of the plot. JJ Comb looking at you. Coming from Gantz, it carries that same nuance of aliens having motivations, but this time the plot allows characters to make connections with them instead of only being enemies. Dandadan makes you feel just as sorry for some of these crazy creatures and extraterrestrials as much as you hated or felt genuine terror for. With genuinely great writing and the actions of our main characters to see what is beneath the surface of others. To see that not everything and everyone is as it seems. And that applies to every character that sits at this table. The character I think emphasizes this immensely is Gigi. At this point, Okurun and Momo are seeing more sides of each other that do begin to blossom in subtle romance, but like a good rom-com, here arrives that tall, hot, cool Chad fuckboy ready to steal your girl. Sometimes I wonder if I have too much time on my hands. Gigi in his very first pages is presented as a romantic alternative for Momo, as they had known each other since childhood and as the next chapter shows, this man has a riz I've not seen anywhere else. First arriving at school, he already gets that girl's number and charms the fuck out of Momo's friends. The reason for his arrival is less upbeat. It's because of a spirit he sees at night inside his family home, one that stares at him, one that refuses to leave and even tries fatally injuring his parents. So Momo and Okurun are tasked to expel it. On the ride there to the countryside, Momo and Gigi are hitting it off despite how long it had been since they had seen each other. It's the kind of bonding you can see from old friends or even potential partners and this makes Okurun react with intense jealousy, trying to break up the conversation and draw the attention back to him. Something he knows feels petty and extremely not like himself. But instead of getting Momo's attention momentarily, it is Gigi who is just as interested in Okurun's wealth of knowledge. And before we know it, Okurun and Gigi are geeking out about these paranormal mysteries. Gigi asking questions and Okarund being stunned that someone like him is interested at all in his answers. An athletic kid who is taller than him, more attractive from his perspective, and someone who is probably more likable. Okarun laments to himself, why did Gigi have to be such a genuine and nice person? Why is he being nice to me of all people? because now he can no longer see him as an opponent to the affection of the girl he likes, but instead a genuine guy who considers any friend of Momo's is his as well, despite how different they appear. These assumptions of characters are exactly what gets subverted in a way that can make us feel like we should never judge them as they may surprise us. And that is not to say these characters don't have flaws or another side to them that can be ugly. They do. Gigi is hiding immense fear of not being able to do anything because of his lack of spiritual power under his bubbly, loud, expressive personality that isn't a facade, but it's all he has to give his friends, which they accept in kind. This is more really than just don't assume things about people and try to see the best in them. This is never being scared to try and show yourself to someone because they probably scared to do the same. What is insane as I read more interviews with Tatsu and his editor is I found that there is not, despite my explaining it, a lot of critical planning when making the series, but instead drawing manga that is fun and interesting 
inspired by his peers, the films he watches, and overall the art he loves. One thing I found interesting about Tatsu's creativity behind his characters are his admittance of not being similar to any of them. In doing this, he has created character archetypes that on the surface seem generic and bland. We have seen character archetypes like Okurun, Momo, Gigi, and Ira, but not under the same roof and not in compromising ways metaphorically and literally like Dandadan shows them. It subverts what we thought in more ways than one. I would be doing you a disservice from showing you too much in terms of what these panels can do. Besides, some of them are pretty intense, including my favorite one, like... You can see it if you want. I mean, it's pretty hardcore. I don't know if you guys are ready. I mean, are you sure? I'm serious. Some of these manga panels fuck you up. And I'm not, I'm not talking about like, oh, you chainsaw mans. Oh, you, oh, so scary. Hunter, hunter. Ooh, that's dark. Even you fucking berserk fans couldn't handle these next panels. I don't think you're ready. These manga panels will fuck you up in a way that no others will. The artistry of these panels is large enough that they can make Da Vinci wet his tidy whities They make you feel emotions you can never truly comprehend. Are you sure you want to see these panels? Fine. Yeah, right? Look at that shit, huh? Oh, that goes hard. Look at that. Oh my god. Okay, I'm being half serious, so let me explain. This manga's art is incredible, and there is one other way that Tatsu shows his characters that many mangaka also do that it's almost an unspoken technique. I like to call them hangout panels. Sometimes key art is used in chapters or volumes where characters are portrayed doing activities not necessarily canon, or general sections of the stories where the characters are doing something ordinary like everyday people. Getting lunch together, working in silence, or having a conversation we can't hear. And that last one I love. I remember seeing panels of One Piece, and as a series I haven't read yet, I can tell they have the essence of characters enjoying their victory after a successful battle. Adding these little tiny stories of them all interacting together in small sections of the panels. Tatsu does the same here, but in a way that feels more real, at least in a way that reminds me of being the age of Ken and Momo. Many times I would walk down to the main street of my hometown with friends to get food and talk about anything. I can never remember what, but that didn't matter because it was with my friends. As I've gotten older, these moments don't happen as much as they do when you're younger. Recently, this did happen to me when I went and visited friends I used to work with. We walked the streets of the city talking about something I don't remember on our way to the next place to drink or eat, and it felt like the only thing that mattered in like the universe. In Dandadan's panels of victory or rest, we see that same feeling. We see characters shine in each panel, but also act like everyday people, running a bit, talking about something in depth, or just general banter, showcasing the traits we now know visually, but also being more comfortable with each other, even if they don't get how they became friends in the first place, or even want to admit it. It's something that feels all the more important when you begin to see so many new characters slowly surround this table, and how each of them kind of belongs here because they don't have anywhere else to go. In my last video, I talked about Gantz and how the characters of that story, although at first strangers, begin to depend on each other and in doing so form an emotional attachment to each other because of how desperate and incomprehensible their situation is. Dandadan is a series lingering in this bizarre space of being so weird and random it just should not work as a story, but ultimately focusing on its characters makes the absurd feel genuine and a triumph. I feel that people who 
are focused more on trying to consume more and more art as opposed to experiencing it and appreciating it for what it is, may find that Dan Da Dan is just nonsense and that is its biggest flaw and there's no denying it because there is no sense to it. But I love that it's a series that doesn't care to over-explain meticulously what makes sense like other series because to do that would rob the joy and mystique of the story it is. It's only when Ken and Momo finally find this new kinship that their worlds change in a very, very dumb and stupid, but amazing way. You start to see that Dandadan isn't just about making friends through odd experiences, but it's about people or beings who find friendship by collectively being outcasts. Iri is the it girl, someone so obsessed with people's perceptions of her that she is socially inept when it comes to true human connection and making friends who are not just wooed by her appearance or social status. Because of this, she gains popularity by manipulating people because she thinks she is better than others. Only when she finally admits to creating untrue rumors about people does she out herself as someone that petty, which puts her in a position of being an outcast of her own doing. Vimola is a heavily inspired Rei Ayanami character who is from somewhere else I can't disclose because oh my god, but she is an outcast of culture because she can't speak the language and doesn't understand the customs. Sakata is a mecha otaku. That's it. He likes mecha and because he enjoys them so much, he has isolated himself from any kind of friend group. The aliens themselves are outcasts. The spirits by nature are outcasts. Granny Psycho is a really, really hot grandma, and that must feel extremely lonely as a demographic, but it's all true. And especially Ken and Momo. Okurun and Momo as characters have both been made to feel outcasted by the world because of what they like and what they believe in. That scene at the start of the video wasn't just used to establish how weird this series gets in the first chapter, but also to show you how early this theme is cemented as Ken walks into the abandoned tunnel. Momo explains that she believes so much in spirits because her grandmother is a medium and she is the only relative she has ever known. She was told to do a ritual every morning on her way to school, which wards off evil spirits. And she faced scrutiny from the other kids because of how weird and dumb it looked. She felt stupid and hated her grandmother for this only to realize she hated how what they were making fun of was her grandma's way. Even if the ritual didn't work, she was raised by a kind, strong carer, believing in her despite all this, even if spirits aren't real. As the chapter continues, Ken finally breaks his silence on his belief in aliens. Trying to save Momo, he confesses he believed in aliens because he had no friends and so badly wished for them to come down and be his friend. Further, ostracizing him from people and never feeling as though people would be interested in him, so what's the point? Until Momo. Even if it was a small act of kindness, she gave him the time of day. His first possible friend. Ken and Momo, after a few misadventures and getting that banana organ back, Return to school and Ken wonders if Momo will actually acknowledge him. They've been through some weird shit, but it was probably a courtesy to say see you tomorrow. But there she is, waiting for him. We don't know what they talked about, but we can see it's a conversation you want to be a part of. And as the school day goes on, both of them have the first major development of the series. Momo wants to talk about aliens, and Ken wants to talk about spirits. The exact opposite of what interests them. Maybe, just maybe, they might really be friends. We all believe in things for silly reasons, and enjoy things for silly reasons. But I think if you have found this video on some level, you have believed or been obsessed with something that others thought was stupid and dumb, not worth paying attention to. Be that video games, movies you liked, a sport that was really niche, an artistic outlet, and of course, manga, especially weird manga. And the reason Tatsu finally landed Dandadan is because of his imagination and joy of drawing something interesting. 
by trialing manga and getting cancelled only to start Dan Dadan from the request of his editor Lin, who said to him, draw what you want. Create something weird for the weirdo outcasts at the table. Because of that inherent, creative, bizarre brain, we got an amazing story of a bunch of outcasts that, as long as it continues, will be fun if it never wants to make sense. Thank you for watching and making it to the end of the video. First off, a quick mention of the Lee Antoinette article, which provided a bulk of info on Tatsu's career. So if you want to know more about him and the editor Lin, please go give it a read. It is really interesting and it's in the description along with other articles that reinforce this video. I also want to say a huge thank you to the amazing people on the Patreon who have helped support this video. Thank you to Lenoriel, Big Nerd, Andrew Goss, Robin, Parker Evans, Corey, Aiden Efrati, Valeria Guerrero Ferreira, Mateus Pastori, Deus Vault, Vinti, Jay the Rebel, A Sloan, MF Soups, Mr. Lamb, Trevin Young, William Maguire, Jeffrey M. Slavins, Tyler Manthe, Christian Jefferson, Marlon Allen, Ghost, Shingoku Satsu, and Marcus Tay. I appreciate it so much guys, and if you want to support more videos like these, you can do so at the Patreon in the description. If you want to talk more manga or nerdy shit, you can do so in the Discord below where I'm actually pretty active and we can have discussions about Dan Dan as well as other series. You can also let me know what you thought of the video in that Discord or the comments below and what you would like to see next. Besides that, I appreciate your time if you want to watch other videos because it just lets YouTube know that people like my stuff. Thank you again guys. But that's all from me. My name is Mugen. As always, have a good one.